Hello to all who may be watching. Today we're going to discuss a common problem and that is disk space. Presently I use a Seagate 5TB NAS drive that's connected to my router and as you can see I only have 15.3 gig available of space. So it's come to that time where a serious upgrade needs to be thought about. This NAS drive served me pretty well. I've had it since 2015 and it's only come to the point now in 2021 where the drive is actually almost at capacity. It has several USB connections on the device and I'd thought about installing extra drives and daisy chaining them to the device to increase the storage capacity without having to spend too much money. In my mind it didn't seem a good idea to just stack more and more drives on top of this drive. Therefore, to me, the next best solution was to build my own home server. That way I could store multiple drives in the server and expand on my overall disk space available on my network. Here's all the components that we'll be using for this build. First up is our Super Micro motherboard which supports dual Intel Xeon E5 2400 series CPUs. And it's all going to live in this 4U rack mount server case which I bought off eBay for £61.04. So let's get this case open and get this hardware installed into the case and I'll talk you through the process as I'm going. First up is to remove this support bracket, which is held in by just two screws. There we go, get that off. First up is power. We're going to be using an Antec High Current Gamer power supply with 520 watts. And that should be sufficient enough to power our board, CPUs and all the hardware we're going to be running in this server. And just four screws holder in place. That's our PSU fitted. We need to just install a couple of additional pegs for the board to sit on. I'm fairly certain that this board is a uh, extended ATX board so it will fill the entire base of this server case and now we need to install our IO shield on the back that installed I'll put the information on the motherboard up on screen as it'll take far too long for me to go through and explain all the expansion sockets, how much memory it can support and CPUs etc etc. It's a lot easier just to post that up on screen if you sort of browse through it at your own leisure and you can see what this board is capable of and all of its features. Now we're going to fasten down the motherboard, screw it into place. As you can see, one of the sockets has a plastic cap cover in the CPU socket 
and that is there for protection. Initially when I acquired this motherboard, it was from a friend of mine who purchased a gaming rig off Facebook Marketplace. And upon inspection, I discovered that it was an Intel Xeon board and swapped it with an Intel i7 board, which is more acceptable for gaming. But in this instance, we're going to be using both of our CPU sockets because we want the maximum performance out of the system. And also, as it states, it, all the features are only unlocked when both CPU sockets are being utilized. Initially, upon receipt of this motherboard, it had an E52407 CPU installed, which is clocked at 2.2 GHz with a 10 Meg Intel Smart Cache. We're going to do away with the E52407 CPU and replace it with dual E52440 CPUs, which are 6 core 12 thread CPUs clocked at 2.4 GHz with a maximum turbo frequency of 2.9 GHz. Now that we've got our CPUs installed, it's time to slap a small pea-sized blob of thermal paste on each one of them and get our heat sinks installed on top of them. Now that the heatsinks are installed, it's time to throw the fans on them. We're going to be using Samsung 8GB DDR3 ECC registered memory modules for the server build, which should be adequate to get us started at least. 
I can further upgrade. I think the board supports up to 384 gigabytes of RAM in total. In terms of graphics, we're just using a GeForce GT610 graphics card for the time being, as we don't need anything particularly powerful, we just need something to display the output to the monitor. Finally, we just need to get power now to the board. Um, we've got an ATX power connector and two additional 8-pin CPU power connectors. I, I don't know why there's two of them because one seems to be sufficient to power the board up and everything's fine. Um, I have tried the extra one installed and it doesn't appear to make any difference whatsoever in terms of performance or how the system seems to run. Finally we just need to attach our front USB sockets and the front panel switches and LEDs on the front of the case, the HDD, reset switch, power, power switch and the power LED and we're good to go for a little test. And there you have it, all looking rather splendid. Please join us in part 2 where we will install some SAS hard drives, an SSD and install a SAS RAID controller card which needs to be flashed from IR mode to IT mode.
Thanks for watching and see you next time. Cheerio.